Good morning, everyone, during this wonderful Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it is wonderful because it explains why you and I are here today and why the rest of the world is not. It is a gorgeous period of time because it talks about not only how we're being exercised by God, perfected in holiness, but how we're ultimately going to be a part of one of the most dynamic changes that has ever taken place. Not like the man mankind talks about trying to go green, but talking about a whole regeneration of the earth, turning it into one of the most beautiful and wonderful places likened unto the Garden of Eden. That will happen when Jesus Christ returns. And he needs a lot of helpers to help execute that wonderful plan. And because of that, he's called every one of us in a very special calling. That's why we're here today. The rest of the world, their time is coming at another time as pictured by the holy days. In fact, Leviticus 23 gives us the correlation of all the holy days, starting with the weekly Sabbath, and then going on into the various holy days, Passover, Unleavened Bread, followed by Pentecost, and then the fall season of the year. And that's when the vast majority of mankind, God is going to deal with them. But things have to be prepared before they can come online. Can't do it all at once because God knows it has to be step by step. Uh, we all have to learn how first, as was mentioned in the sermonette, that uh, we all have to learn how to love God. Uh, we didn't know that, as was discussed. And when you think about that, you know, you just come into a ready-made world and you just go about doing what everybody else does. And you think it's normal and natural. Well, look what people are having to grow up in today. Things that are not natural, things that are not normal, and certainly not sanctioned by the Word of God. But yet people are saying, well, everybody else is doing it. Well, that doesn't make it right. That's why God has called us out of the world. We have to live in it. We have to learn the lessons of life through it. But he's called us out of the world so that we can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and become like our elder brother and Savior and high priest at the right hand of God so that we will be able to serve in the kingdom of God for which we have been called in our Passover the other night, and then the night to be observed. All of this dovetails together to explain who and why we are and what our future is for not only us, but for our sons and daughters, what their future is. Because it's not very encouraging when you look outside and see the world and the way it's going. It really is causing a lot of people problems and difficulties. They can't seem to quite get a handle on it, and that's understandable. They just haven't been clued into what is happening. You and I have been given insight to understand what's happening. And what we have to do now is make the most of this time. And it goes back almost to a song that came to mind I heard some years ago. And it's one that, again, I don't think most of us have ever heard. Some of us may have. But it went, I'm not going to sing the song, but I'm going to give you the key that what st stuck in my mind from it. It was called Accentuate the Positive, Eliminate the Negative, and get rid of Mr. In-Between. That's a good mantra for all of us to say. We have to stay positive-minded. We have to do what? We have to know that we don't need to be negative, but we live in a negative world. It's on us constantly. And then we have to get rid of Mr. In-Between. Why? Because Mr. In-Between is when you're sitting there vacillating back and forth. Should I do this? Should I do that? Reminds me of the old joke about you don't want to be a mugwump. And you might say, what in the world is a mugwump? A mugwump is a person who sits on the fence with his mug on one side and his wump on the other side. And that's a mugwump. It's interesting, but it's a little humorous to show us again, people live in a day and age of indecision. They have problems making decisions because so much is happening so fast and so quick. Well, let's take a look at this wonderful period of time, this day today. We're going to celebrate this day that begins the days of unleavened bread. And what we're going to talk about today, and this is the title of the sermon, the days of unleavened bread meet in due season. The days of unleavened bread meet in due season. I'd like you to join me by going to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. Because here we have some wonderful instruction from God. It helps us to understand exactly 
why this is so important to us, why it's not something to overlook. And we're going to go, we're going to go from verse 1 through 15, verses 1 through 15. All right, in the psalm, the psalmist David praising God. This is what you and I need to do as well. It says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. And that is very important because that is part of the glory that is in God's position. Every day will I bless you. So that's an admonition to us. Don't let a day go by without giving God glory and praise. He says, every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever because there's no name like the almighty Yahweh, the ever living one, the sovereign Lord of the scripture. And he says in verse 3, the psalmist, great is the Lord. It's hard for us to really comprehend what's involved in that word great, but it is truly a manifestation of what God is and greatly to be praised. Why? And his greatness is unsearchable. Now that's the thing of it is. See, you can't figure out God. He is so far above and beyond all of us as human beings and our comprehension is limited. We are restricted because of certain basic things God has placed upon mankind. But as you read this here, it, like it says, one generation shall praise your name works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Most people don't even know what the mighty acts of God is as far as what has happened. I will speak of the glorious honor of his majesty and of your wondrous works. That was what God said he wanted the children of Israel to teach and pass on to the next generation. But by the time it came to the book of Judges and all the leadership had died off, what did we learn? It says there arose another generation that knew not the Lord nor his works. We have to be reminded of the world we live in is a miraculous world. It is not a world that you just kind of put together with, uh, you know, cheese and bailing wire. It's not something simple. It's, it's very complex. And that's the whole thing. Life, when you understand God, who is the source and the only source of eternal life, he is responsible for all life that exists. And he sustains it all by the word of his power. And the reason why this is so important for us to understand is because when you talk about life, it's complex. You can't understand it all. For example, we as human beings are made male and female. We are very complex. We live, but we live because of all these complex elements put together. And when you look at the human body, you say, wow, you're just overwhelmed. And you say, how did this happen? How, why, how is it this way? And why does everything just work the way it does? It's because that's how God is. He's revealing himself to mankind. That God and the source of life is very complex. It is not easy to understand. And you're not able to grasp God because he's so far greater than all of our capabilities put together. And so the psalmist understands this and he says, I will speak of your glorious honor of your majesty. Yes, when we say your majesty, he is truly majestic. And of your wondrous works, all men shall speak of the might of your terrible acts. Yeah, that's right. He has the capacity to do awesome things that scare the daylights out of you as a human being because we're so fragile, we're so here today and gone tomorrow, but God is everlasting. He is the source that generates life to everything, even the springtime, the trees and the birds and all the things we see now coming in the spring of the year all represent this rebirth that only God can generate within creation. So he says, and men shall speak of this, and number seven, verse seven, then shall abundant, they shall abundantly honor or utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. That's why we have song services every Sabbath when we gather. We sing of God's righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. And yes, we should all thank God for that. We've all done enough to have violated the laws of God 
We're just grateful he is a God of mercy and loves us. And he's teaching us how to love him in return in a way that you and I have never known. But it's by keeping his commandments and doing those things pleasing in his sight. And that's how it says, this is the love of God. This is how I know you love me, because you're doing what I ask of you. So we've been doing all of that here recently as we started the Passover and the night to be observed. Now we're into days of unleavened bread. Verse 9, the Lord is good to all. Yes, everyone. The good guys, the bad guys. He makes the rain to fall on the just. He makes it to fall on the unjust. God is good. He always has been, but he sure has been maligned by the world and the evil source that dominates this world at this time, Satan the devil. He always misrepresents God and always makes it seem like God is the one that's causing all our troubles just to avoid focusing on sin, which is our problem. And that's a spiritual problem and cannot be arrested until you understand by the calling of God where you're in violation because you don't know what you don't know. I didn't know, you don't know. We all have to learn about these things. So God being spirit and we being flesh talks to us in terms we can relate to, physical things. And that physical teaches us certain spiritual things in the dimension of life. So it goes on and it says here in verse 10, all your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. Absolutely. We have so much to be thankful for and appreciative with our great God. He says, verse 11, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. Boy, power, talk about power. How does he put those stars out there like he does? And you and I can name a few of them. He can call them all by name. You say, well, what's that one way back out there somewhere? He says, oh, that's such and such a star. He, he can give you the name because he made it. That is incredible to think about how this great source of power and wisdom and knowledge and understanding, nobody taught him. He's always had this ability and we're just learning about him and we're just, as we say, scratching the surface of all that God is. And that goes on to say that she'll talk about this in your kingdom, verse 13, is an everlasting kingdom. Yeah, that's why he's still from this generation to the next, that's why he says, I am the great I am that I am. He lives in the constant presence of every generation that has been, and he lives forever. Ah, eternal life. How do you even comprehend that? It says he lives in the beauty of holiness, in unapproachable light. These are phenomenal things that the Bible describes of this great God, our creator, and our maker and our heavenly father. Verse 14, the Lord upholds all that fall. Yes, you and I have stumbled and fallen from time to time and he does, he does what? He upholds us, he lifts us back up and gives us the wherewithal to continue on. Why? Because the lesson is never look back, always go forward. That's God's purpose in life. All creation is moving forward to fulfill the will of God. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. They've come, they've gone, they've come, they're gone, but God is always there watching over every aspect. And in verse 15, the eyes of all wait upon you and you give them, notice, meat in due season. That's why we chose that to begin with. Because you don't ever want to take these holy days that God has given to us, which is an outline of his great plan of salvation. You don't want to treat them lightly or take it from the standpoint, well, I know that, I've heard that before about, you know, the days of unleavened bread. Yeah, but the spiritual intent and meaning of these days, that's the meat of what it's all about. You can have the surface knowledge, you know these days, you can name them all and so forth, but do you apply them personally to yourself? Do you make them really come alive in your life? Almighty God has provided for us this day, the day that starts as a holy convocation, as a marvelous feast designed to feed us. This feast feeds us and keeps us in remembrance of why we're here. Why God called you? Why did he reach down and touch you and not somebody else? 
we all struggle with that from time to time. We think, well, there's other people a lot better than we are, so why does he call us? Because God, in his great wisdom and in creating us, he looks down upon his creation, and he has this plan and purpose. And you and I have been purposed to be in that final generation that the scripture talks about. We are in the position no other generation has ever been. We see what is coming by the grace of God because he's outlined it for us. But we can look back in time and see things that have happened in the past as a type of what is going to be the fulfillment in the end time. This gives you a tremendous peace of mind and understanding because the world will be going to pieces at a time when God says, in your patience, possess you your soul. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be fearful. Jesus said, these things have got to come to pass. So don't, don't be worried. What am I going to do? How am I going to? God has got this covered. He's got our bases covered. But he does require something of us, that we've got to trust him and we've got to look to him for deliverance. Because if we don't, there's no way we can deliver ourselves from our problems. The problems come from a source that is far more dangerous than any of us realize. Satan the devil, an enemy that has to be resisted, he has to be fought, but the only way you can fight him is through the power of Almighty God. That power reigns supreme, and Satan and the demonic world, they know it. And they fear us as individuals, and they want you to feel uncertain about your calling. You lose your confidence when the Proverbs 3 tells us, the Lord shall be your confidence and keep your foot from being taken. That's what David had to have when he ran out and faced Goliath. If he hadn't had the confidence, God was going to be with him. You know, you come after me, but I come in the name of the armies of the living God. And God backed him up. Because when we support what God says and we do those things like Passover, it says, happy are you if you do these things. So what if you don't do them? You're going to be unhappy. Flip the coin, plain and simple. You won't know it. You might think, well, I, don't, I can be happy. I don't need any of this. Try it. Keep going. See what happens. Sooner or later in life, it'll kick you a good one, and you'll realize something else is going on here that is much more than I can comprehend of myself. So what we understand then is this. The feast days are designed to give us the spiritual meat and wisdom and understanding of his holy word. Because this Bible is sealed to the world. They don't understand it. They can take bits and pieces of it and they create things and they get misunderstandings. They get a little bit here, a little bit, but it's not the picture. Because they don't observe those days that God says, these are my festivals. That's what Leviticus 23 reminds us that you can't just pick and choose what you want. You've got to listen to what God says. We're learning what Adam and Eve failed to do in the garden. What is that? Obey my voice. What did the Israelites fail to do? Obey my voice. What are you and I commanded to do? Obey my voice. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change his battle plan. He's already got it laid out. Christ was already given as the Lamb of God from the foundation of the world. So you and I are blessed in this way to know and understand that the physical things God gives us, they are a type of the spiritual lesson we are to learn. That's how God gets his spiritual lesson across to us, by teaching us to do the physical. When you don't do it, you can't learn the spiritual. So God watches us and he sees when we start to do what he says, like remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh, you stepped out in faith. You believe the seventh day is really the seventh day? According to the Bible, then what happens? Immediately God sees that and he says, let's give them a little bit more understanding. And that's how you and I have grown over the years. We didn't learn that when I was first baptized, I, my heart was there, but I didn't know all these things. The years have just, as we say, just ripened with great understanding and blessings that have come by living life. You can't learn all these things when you're just young as a babe in Christ, but you have to have faith and confidence that God is not going to abandon you. And if you trust him, like it says in Hebrews 11, and know that in verse 6, it is impossible to please God 
if you don't have faith and trust in him. If you can't trust him, who do you trust? I submit he's the only one to trust in this day and age because you can see all the people today are in a state of quandary and upheaval. They don't know who to trust, what to believe. No wonder when Jesus comes, he says, shall he find faith on the earth? Is anybody going to listen and believe the things of God? No, uh -uh. no, a lot of them won't. Why? Because iniquity will abound and the love of the majority will wax cold. Then God will have another opportunity to warn them. He'll send the two witnesses, as we know. The scripture tells us that. You and I believe that. Others talk about it, but they don't understand why. It's necessary so that that innumerable multitude, many people in these other organizations and denominations who have much of the things that the Bible, they say they believe in Jesus, that's good. They say other things that the Bible says, that's good. But what don't they understand? They don't understand the sign between God and his people, the Sabbath. It's a sign between you and me, God said. And people say, oh, that was for Israel. Well, the problem is they don't know who Israel is. But you and I do. Why? We have been educated by the word of God, and God has, through his spirit, taught us where those Israelites are today. And we can see things happening to them around the world exactly as the Bible said. Because this is the book of Israel, a warning to Israel. And so you and I today are blessed to grasp these things in a way most cannot because Romans 15 verse 4 really resonates with us. And what is that? All was written for our learning. See, you and I are going to school. You and I have to learn, just like you have to do even in the secular world. You have to go to school, go through the various paces to do what? Well, when you're in grades or kindergarten in the early grades, you're not graduating as a senior. You have to go through middle school, then you go through, you know, the high school, then on to college. It's a progression. The same way is true with God's truth. These days are reiterated on a yearly basis. Why does God do that? Because as you get older, you begin with mileage and experience. You learn, oh, these days, man, I'd be lost without these days. Why? I'd be wandering all over the place and not know where to go. This tells me who I am, why I am, why I'm a man, why I'm a woman, where I'm going. I don't have to listen to all this confusion where people don't know if there are this, that, or what have you. You and I have been so blessed by the hand of God. Now, recorded events in the Old Testament were all written for our learning. That's a big lesson to always remember. Don't just read it and pass over it. It's there for a reason. And God only tells us what he wants us to know. You know, you only got six chapters, I believe, that account from Adam and Eve to the flood. There was a lot of stuff going on back there at that time. But most of it, God says, isn't worth recording. All he did is give us the key stuff that we needed to know that brought about the great flood in the Noatian deluge. Now, from that point on, in the New Testament or the Old Testament, we start with Abraham. And what does Abraham do? We see how God is building his nation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, how the whole tribe comes together, how they all end up going back to Egypt. It becomes an exciting journey, but that's how it has to go, step by step by step. So what we see here is that what we are about to do today is to embark, go back in time on a journey. We're going to focus on the deliverance of the people that had been held in bondage for 400 years. And how long have you been living? How long has bondage been in your life? And you didn't even realize it. You just lived life. Nobody told you you were in bondage. You would say, well, I'm free. Well, that's what the Pharisees said. They said, well, huh, well you know, what are you talking about? We're free. We've never been in bondage. Oh, yes, they were. The bondage of sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. So the focus on deliverance is very important because God wants you to understand. He wants all of us to understand. And ultimately, mankind is going to have to learn this lesson that the only way you can be delivered from your chaotic state of affairs is by the hand of God. The Israelites were slaves. They couldn't do a thing to, in order to grasp the focus of that, we have to realize 
the people of Israel are the focus of the Old Testament. But where people go haywire is that they separate themselves from the Bible. They say that all happened to them as if we're excluded because we're Gentiles. No, God is doing everything for everyone. But first priorities, Israel. Second priority, Church of God, spiritually. Third priority, the rest of the world in due time. God takes one step at a time and he runs us through the exercises of life because he's perfecting something in us. And that's what becomes so important. Remember always, God deals first with the physical and then the lesson is in the spiritual of what you see and what is recorded. Now, ancient Israel, people of Israel, they were held in slavery in a land of Egypt. Their deliverance at the hand of Almighty God is the focus of Passover, the night to be observed, and then the days of unleavened bread as they marched toward Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. Now in order for us to grasp the importance of all that, you and I have to take into account the awesome events and how it relates to us today. Because a lot of people say, well, what, what, what di what's the difference? How does that affect me today? You know, those people are long gone. Yeah, but their memory re reminds us each and every year their memory is still alive. Why? Because they were flesh. You and I are flesh, but we have one advantage they didn't have, the Holy Spirit. When we were called of God, God gave us something in the New Testament, and therefore we are more accountable than those past generations. Because we sit here and we know what they, they wanted to know but couldn't. Daniel said, oh my Lord, teach me, show me. Well, what is all this stuff you've shown me? Go your way, Daniel, because it's sealed to the time of the end. It was for the people who needed to know about. That's you and I. You and I don't want to get hit blindsided with this stuff. We need to know what God would have us do. Now, remember the Israelites, they themselves had the same opportunities, but they didn't mix their relationship with God with faith and trust. That's why they failed. You and I are warned. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 3 reminds us that this is our calling that we must be mindful of. Because if we treat it lightly, it would be to our disastrous end as well. We were given the opportunity that they didn't have, the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we find ourselves that the Israelites, the story of the Israelites, and here's where it gets interesting and why certain things happened the way they did. The Israelites were basically city dwellers. Remember, they lived in captivity under forced labor by the Egyptians. They lived that way for over 400 years. And what was now going to happen was a dynamic change. The Egyptians had beaten them down, but God was going to come down through Moses and as he sent Moses, he said, I'm going to deliver my people because I've heard the cries. They're, they're in terrible bondage through their taskmasters. You and I, these, these statements that are made, you and I don't realize we're in terrible bondage. We have had problems in Diva. We, we think of ourselves as a free people because we're blessed in to live in a country that has given more birth to freedom than any other country. The only reason why is because the laws were built on the fundamentals of the Bible, the Ten Commandments. Now you and I have witnessed something that's happened. The Ten Commandments are gone. The Bible's being thrown out. Sorry, you can't pray. You offend me when you talk about God. Talk about any other religion, any other God. No wonder the book of Jeremiah, a very powerful book that ties it all together from Old Testament to New. And it tells us what? My people have committed two terrible sins. They have forgotten the, the, the fountain of living water, which is God, where life is, and they've tried to solve problems through hewing out cisterns that can hold no water, trying to work it out themselves, and it doesn't work. Every time their heart wants to change it, they talk peace, but they don't know how to deliver peace because only God can provide the kind of peace necessary. And that comes... When do we get our initiation to peace? 
when we become surrendering to God. And when we surrender to God, you become no longer an enemy of God, you're in harmony with God. You're surrendering to Him your will in deference to His will. And that's why Jesus constantly said everything He did, not my will, but your will be done, Father in heaven. We have to constantly remember that too because where our problems come is when we get kind of feisty and that carnal human nature rises up and what do we do? We want our way. And <laughs> you can see that starting from little children, little children, where a parent gives a toy and then take that toy away from the child, the child goes berserk until it gets, the child, it gets what it wants back and then it calms down. We all want our own way. The Bible is telling us we all have to learn how to surrender our way to God's way, to have peace. Then we won't be an enemy, but friends of God. Now, the Israelites being a basically city dwellers, this posed a real problem in a sense, as you'll see as this story un unravels. Because on the night of the Passover, they were all in their homes, and this is the only time Old Testament Israel actually did what God asked Moses to tell them. Stay in your house, take the blood of a lamb, put it on the door all over the top and bottom sides, everything. When the death angel comes, passes over, you will be spared. Every house where that does not happen, everyone will die, human or animal. And this becomes interesting because, again, you can really make it apply to yourself if you happen to be a firstborn. If you're a firstborn, then you realize that could be you if you didn't follow instruction. Now, there was a mixed multitude that also feared that because of that night and what happened. They went out with the Israelites. So at midnight, the death angel comes, goes over the land. He passes over the homes where he saw the blood, the firstborn of all without the blood and lamb died, even at Pharaoh's own home. And that was a tremendous shock that really brought the Egyptians to a reality. They're dealing with something here that is above and beyond anything that they have ever dealt with that they call gods. This is where God, the creator of heaven and earth, was doing what? He was revealing himself. And he was doing what? Showing his people Israel, who had been in captivity for 400 years, it takes my mighty hand to break the back of this nation and set you free because you couldn't do it yourself. Then on top of that, God was witnessing to these Egyptians. You have taken my people and done this and I've told them you to let them go and you didn't let them go. Therefore, I have destroyed your gods. Every god you have worshipped, I have destroyed because I am God and there is none other. That is a great lesson that God wants mankind to learn that they haven't learned yet. You and I hopefully have learned that, that the fear of God is before your eyes and deep within your heart because you want to walk humbly with your God and always be in harmony with him. And because of that, God says, I will bless you. That's all he's ever wanted to do is to bless us like any human parent wants to do what to their children? Bless them, give them. Every time a child says, Mommy, Daddy, I'm hungry, you're ready to give them food, something to eat. You always are there for them. You're caring for them. Well, this is part of it. God destroyed the gods of Egypt and he revealed himself to his people and the Egyptians that only God can deliver. That's what you and I have to remember and drill that into our minds during these holy days. Only God can deliver us. You can have a surface knowledge of that and say, okay, I believe God can deliver, but when push comes to shove, like the Israelites. What's going to happen then? They, if they had not listened and followed in instructions, stepped outside of that house when that death angel came, that would have been history. It would have been gone. So they had to follow in instructions. You and I have to follow instructions. Now, Moses led the people out of Egypt with a high hand on the day after the Passover. That's found in Numbers 33, by the way, and verse 3. So we always remember 
When people get all confused on which day the Passover is, it makes it very plain. Passover's on the 14th. Better get your calendar and look at it. How is the 14th? The evening and the morning were a day. So on the evening and the morning of the 14th, that's the Passover. Then the evening and the morning of the 15th, that's the next day. That's the holy day, the high day. So that's the 15th. 14th for Passover, 15th for unleavened bread. Now here's what really gets interesting, and this is how this story keeps moving. They were now a free people. You hear a lot of talk about freedom, freedom. Everybody wants freedom, freedom. But they all want freedom their way. They don't want freedom God's way. They want freedom their way. And if they, if they hear God wants to, to rule over them, they get upset with that. No, I don't want anybody ruling over me. I want to be free. Well, what happened? We find that as those free people had this newfound freedom that God provided in Exodus 13 and verse 17. Let's go to Exodus 13 and verse 17. Exodus 13 and verse 17. After they had been set free and God had delivered them, in verse 17 of this chapter, it says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, that would have been a lot closer, near. For God said, this is what he told Moses, that peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. You see, God did not want them to go back. He wanted them to go forward. But he knew they were not trained for warfare. In fact, God was going to have to fight for them, just like he had to fight to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Egyptians originally. And God said, But God let the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up and harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So here we see a very interesting explanation of why did God take them the long way? Because they would have panicked. Why does God do some of the things he does with us in the way that he does it? If he did certain things the way we might think should be done, we would panic because we're just like them. We're just human beings. And we need God's help. We need God's direction in order to sustain life, to be able to go forward. So what do we have here? These free people now would have panicked, gone back. So Exodus 14, just move along on the chapter here. Let's go chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Just hitting the highlights. Speak to the children of Israel where they were encamped. And of course they were all entangled, verse 3, entangled in the land by the wilderness. And Pharaoh thought he had it. He said, <laughs> a bunch, if their God brought them here, what a God do they have? Because that God can't do anything for them. We're just going to go down and wipe them out. But it didn't happen that way. God had a plan that they didn't even know about. And what was that? He was going to open the Red Sea. Now that's a God that can do something. And that's exactly what he did. And Pharaoh and his army just stand there stunned because they'd never seen any action like that. And before, while they were going through it, during the night there was fire there to keep the separation between the people till all of them got on the safe side. And who was doing all this? God. Why was he doing it that way? That you may know that I am the Lord God. That there's none else. Only God can do these miraculous things. And these are the things God wants us to be encouraged by. And then he said in verse 4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and that he will follow after them. And he says, and I will be honored. Notice, the Egyptians didn't know this God, the God of Israel. They were learning. See, you and I didn't know the God of Israel. We're learning. We're learning about the one true God who's the God of all human beings made in the image of God. The story goes on, verse 8, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He pursued with the children of Israel. They went into the water, and then you know the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey says. They all became fish bait. They died. Totally, you know, you, you stop and wonder to yourself, 
Why would you want to go through that water when you watch the people go and you see it up there and their God has done all these marvelous things and you think, well, I'm, I'm still going to go get them. It's because God said what? He hardened his heart. The average person wouldn't have done that. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Why? Because God says, I will gain honor from this. I'm going to show them and the word is going to go out throughout the nations. They're going to hear, man alive, did you hear what happened to those Israelites? They came out of Egypt. Their God delivered them out of there, out of slavery. And he's fighting for them. Man, what a God. And that's what God is revealing, how awesome he is. All right, God delivered them at the Red Sea. They moved them into the wilderness. And you know what happened then after coming through the Red Sea. I've said this myself many a time. You would think... Man, with our God who delivered us, I mean, we were a bunch of slaves, and now here we are delivered. And what's going to happen? I'm thirsty. Grumble, 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 murmur, murmur, murmur. I'm out here in the middle of the desert area. Back home, I at least could drink when I wanted to drink, and yeah, it wasn't the best conditions, but I could get meat when I wanted meat. Grumble, grumble, grumble. See, we're, we're told that's what they did. Now, you and I wouldn't grumble, would we? No, no, we're so strong that we, we would never do anything like that. We've never grumbled. We've never murmured. And you begin to realize we're just like them. Just like them in every way, shape, and form. The only difference is God has given us a helper to fight the flesh, to fight down those wrong human initiatives that we want to do on our part and when we do that God comes to our aid he fights for us like he fought for them that's the great lesson don't ever doubt God he'll fight for you as long as you're with him you're his and he's going to fight protect his and he's not going to let any enemy take it out of his hands that's the beautiful understanding of the word of God no they were a free people, but they were not used to the newfound freedom. You know, when we were first converted, we were in the same way. We were now free spiritually, but we did what? We still kept going back, didn't we? We still made all kinds of dumb, stupid mistakes. And we kept having to go back to God, and we felt terrible. Why? Because you, last time you prayed, you said, I'll never do that again. Well, maybe you never did. I'm human. I made my mistakes. I, I pretty much would guess that you made yours too. We're all in the same boat. Because there's nobody that's exempt from this, according to this story, this marvelous story that reveals our human weakness. We are our own worst enemy. And that has to be fought every day of our life. No, they, God deliver them. But we were told in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, that that, they went out with a high hand, but they didn't really know what was ahead. They couldn't see. They were told the promised land's waiting for you, but they didn't know they had to go through all this. How many things did you and I have to go through when we first were converted? Yeah, we said, why do I have to go through this? Why is it this way? Because we get a small taste of what others have had to go through. We're just like every other human being. So 1 Corinthians tells us very plainly, they had to rely on God as they walked through that wilderness area. You and I in faith, have to, we have to walk with God every day. You don't know what's coming tomorrow. Nobody does. None of us. But God has promised he'll do what? He'll walk with us. His presence went with the Israelites, but they didn't acknowledge his presence except to complain they were never satisfied. You and I can have the presence of God walking with us every day if we so desire. He wants to give us his presence. But it is only if you are in harmony with him. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it's a warning given to us that all these things are happening as examples for the end time church of God. The lesson is that God provides, don't look backward. God provides, don't look backward backward opportunities for growth come in faith 
God will never put anything on us greater than we can bear. It says that he will also provide a way of escape. He's not out to break us. He's out to save us. And he will help us to get rid of the things that need to go. That's why we're going to eat unleavened bread, aren't we? We're going to eat some today. And we're going to do that. And we're going to eat it. And we remind ourselves that God is working in through, in and through us to accomplish his will. See, in the Old Testament, he worked externally with the Israelites. With us, he's working internally. He's working inside of us to do his will and good pleasure. All right, the lesson then, we will have no place to hide and he will not place more on us than we can handle. So we don't have to worry about that. John chapter 6. Let's go to John chapter 6 in the New Testament. And verse 63. A good scripture for all of us to remember. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickens and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the Bible is a book that has to be revealed to you through the Spirit of God, unlocks the word these scriptures mean. That's why many years ago you would look at the Bible and you couldn't figure it out. It didn't make any sense to you. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, you got the certain key pieces to get in the puzzle and all of a sudden the Bible comes alive. Now it's telling you things you never understood before. And so the Spirit is where God operates and he works through the physical to teach us spiritual lessons so that we can think like God thinks. Right now, we don't have that same capability. It's a stage for growth and you read the rest of that chapter and the people, Jesus was feeding the people and then he went on the other side of the lake and then the people came. He knew what their reason was. They just wanted a free meal. They like having a free meal because this, this, whoever this God is, Jesus, he, he must be the Messiah because he feeds us. He gives us. We'll, we'll, we'll want that. Then he goes into and explains that he's the true bread of life. All that we keep and understand with the Passover. Then he said about eating it. You read the rest of this. And they listen to him talking. He said, we have to do what did you say, Master? You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood? Are you talking cannibalism? What are you talking about? That's where the human physical mind goes. The spiritual mind realizes there's a great significance here. And what he is, he's saying, the words that he has are words of eternal life. And so what did he then, well, they were, they were shocked by that. Most of them walked away. Then he turns to the original disciples and he says, what? In verse 68, then Simon Peter answered Jesus. He says, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We can't find them anywhere else. Nobody else talks like you do. Nobody else gives us understanding about these things. Only you do. That's the correct answer. That's the correct answer. And how did he know that? Because again, the Holy Spirit was working with him to focus on attention that you and I never forget that our future depends on the Son of God. He's the key person in our life. If you go to Exodus 23, and we'll wrap this up here now at this point. In Exodus 23, I'll go through this very quickly here and summarize this. In verse 23, you find out the f promises that God said he would do for his people. That was for physical Israel. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's doing the same for us today. And what is that? Well, in verse, well, the first thing he promised in verse 22 was that he would be an enemy to your enemies and fight for you. Isn't that nice to know? You got somebody out there who's gunning for you. God says, I'm going to gun for that person too on your behalf. I'm going to protect you from that because you're my son, you're my daughter. Then number two, how about verse 25? He said, he would bless our water and our bread. In other words, he would provide sustenance daily for us, food and shelter. And he does. Three, he would take away sickness from our midst. Verse 25, that's what he promised them, that he was the God healer. 
And what does that mean for us? That we can go to God and ask Him for healing. And there is a lot of need for healing. There are a wide variety of circumstances in the lives of many people. And so, again, that's a promise that should be invoked in prayer. Number four, he would grant long life and growth of national, the national identity of Israel. They would grow prophets, become a great nation. And we've seen that. We've lived in our day and age at the high day of the kingdom of Manasseh. We've had the benefits and God provided everything he said he would. And it says in verse 5 there, in verse 28, excuse me, the fifth point is that he would send his fear upon the enemies using hornets. Now here's an interesting story I'll share with you. As a freshman, we went to Squaw Valley years ago. I think it was in the early 60s that uh, we went to Squaw Valley and to keep the feast. The only problem was there were other people there ahead of us. And they didn't want to leave. They wanted to extend their, their time there, but we were scheduled to come in next. And so the problem was that they didn't want to go. And they didn't want to throw them out because they were already there. And so what do we do? How are we going to go? Out of nowhere, out of nowhere came hornets. That's why that means something to me, because I remember this very well. Hornets came out of nowhere. Now, why would hornets come out of nowhere? But hornets came, and it was messing up all their plans to say we were going to do what they were going to do there at, the, at Squaw Valley. And they, they said, nope, we've got to get out of here. There's hornets everywhere. As soon as they got out and the hornets disappeared, we went in and kept the Feast of Tabernacles. <laughs> that means something when you've been there and you see it happen in living color. I never forgot that. So, again, God uses his tools that he's created. Hornets are very effective. He doesn't need guns and bombs and bullets. He just sends in hornets and all kinds of little critters that he has. And boy, he can drive them nuts. He can give them fleas and lice and all kinds of things and, you know, just ruin their whole existence. That's because he's a great God. He can do all these things. All right, the sixth point was verse 31. He would set the borders and the bounds of their nation. Well, that's what God did with us. He gave us borders. Now you and I are watching those borders being destroyed before our very eyes. It's sad, but it's true. So the seventh point is just this. Dear brethren, it only gets better as we go to the kingdom of God. So I wanted to rehearse this as we start off on this first day. We've had a wonderful beginning. We're about to have a nice potluck. All of us enjoy this fellowship together. I do understand we need to be out by one o'clock, so we need to work because there's another group coming in, a Sunday keeping group after us, and we, we were given this opportunity here. This is our normal morning time. So let's enjoy. God be with you all, and shalom.